Hello. <laughs> this is the part that always makes me feel like Tina Turner, but actually I'm just Jane Wolf. Um, I'm the director of our faculty's uh, master's program in landscape architecture, and I'd like to welcome you all um, to tonight's um, lecture. It's a real uh, pleasure and privilege to welcome Beth Meyer as our seventh annual Michael Huff Ontario Association of Landscape Architects visiting critic. Um, a few words about this appointment. Um, the, the visiting critic's position was endowed in honor of Michael Hoff, who was the founding program head in landscape architecture at the University of Toronto. And the position was established here at the Daniels faculty by the Ontario Association of Landscape Architects uh, and by the professional community to bring an international figure in contemporary urban landscape practice to the faculty um, annually. So we've had a really wonderful um, list of visitors, uh, James Corner, Christophe Giraud, uh, Adrian Rose, Michael Van Valkenburg, Kanjin Yu, uh, and Dirk Simons, and um, we're very pleased um, now to welcome um, Beth Meyer. We're all very grateful for the ongoing and generous support of the Ontario Association of Landscape architects in making these lively and engaging visits uh, possible. And I'd like to re uh, recognize two um, representatives of the OALA, Elise Shelley, our faculty uh, representative on the OALA Governing Council, uh, and Glenn O'Connor, who's the OALA president, um, who will uh, say a few words on behalf of the association. Great, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Ontario Association of Landscape Architects, I'd like to um, just say welcome, and we're pleased to be able to support U of T and uh, all of the great work that you do here. And the association is absolutely committed to standing behind the students and uh, great opportunities like this. So again, thank you very much, and I look forward to a wonderful lecture tonight. Thanks. A few words about Beth. Um, long story short, she's really one of the bright lights in our field. Um, she has an amazing list of accomplishments that I will, I'll only summarize briefly. Um, since 1993, she's been a member of the faculty of the University of Virginia School of Architecture, where she um, has been department chair not once but twice. Uh, she taught previously at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and at uh, Cornell University. And she began her career uh, in landscape architecture in practice at EDAW and at Hannah Olin, now uh, the Olin Partnership. This year, she was named one of the tw top 25 most admired educators in the United States by Design Intelligence. Uh, she's written an extraordinary range of essays and articles on landscape design practice and theory uh, on both historical and contemporary subjects. Uh, she's a registered landscape architect, and she's brought her scholarly concerns to contemporary practice through a consultancy that's uh, included most recently um, her collaboration with Michael Van Valkenburg Associates on the uh, redesign of the um, Kylie and Saarinen uh, project for the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial, uh, better known as the St. Louis uh, Arch. Um, she is a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects, and she's received honors, grants, and awards from the Council of Educators and Landscape Architecture, the American Society of Landscape Architects, the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, and the University of Virginia. So uh, before I welcome Beth, I'll conclude my uh, remarks with a true confession. Um, she was my very first teacher in graduate school. Um, I, <laughs> I thought then, and I have thought many times across the vast distance of time and space uh, between now and then, that she might be one of the very smartest people I've ever met. And a note from my students, it's she who taught me to tear my tracing paper off the roll nicely. So Beth, thank you for joining us. That last fact wasn't lost on the studio I sat in today. <laughs> Anyway, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've known several of the faculty here for um, a bit, uh, and I uh, think there's an incredible uh, 
both faculty and from what I could tell today, student body um, here at the University of Toronto in the Landscape Architecture Program. So I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, what I'm going to do today is um, share with you uh, some insights I have about the relationship between um, sustainability and aesthetics, the unspoken fourth um, E, if you will. And I want to um, preface uh, my remarks uh, with a couple of um, uh, comments about why I wrote this manifesto in a bit of a hissy fit a few years ago. It was the least uh, academic, uh, intellectual piece uh, that I've um, written and probably not surprisingly, the one that I've gotten the, the most feedback and response from. Um, I was, uh, like I think a lot of you, frustrated with the discussions and the um, writing about sustainability as a discourse. And I was really worried about the uh, ongoing focus, maybe over concern for process in our fields, um, over form. And I, so, I know that sounds retrograde, but in the end of the day, uh, designers bring to the making of cities and landscapes something that, uh, are, we get, are we getting feedback? Um, that engineers and restoration ecologists do not. Um, I've been uh, heartened uh, and also surprised uh, at the response. Uh, both positive but also critical. And uh, in my lecture today, I'm not simply delivering uh, the manifesto, but trying to share with you the way in which I've been working out um, some of the responses. And I want to just uh, summarize uh, uh, them uh, in three ways. And I think it'll help you to see the kind of back and forth uh, as I'm um, not only um, sharing with you how my uh, initial ideas in the manifesto have um, evolved, but actually um, how I've um, started to restructure and reimagine that manifesto. I mean, the first is semantic but important one in that um, the uh, title Sustaining Beauty for me was always about multiple beauties and appearances, and yet it was clear some people couldn't get beyond the singular. So I'm talking about um, a broad range of beauties, and I, I think about the 18th century debates about everything from the picturesque to the sublime, which were always described as forms of beauty, so kind of stretching of categories. Um, and so I'm um, interested uh, in a broad range and also changing conceptions of um, beauty and aesthetics. Um, I also um, have been taken to task uh, by several of my colleagues for not um, attending enough to the full range of aesthetic experience. And I've actually learned quite a lot about the relationship between beauty and ugliness over the last couple of years, and um, particularly um, observations that um, uh, beauty and uh, ugliness are, in fact, not uh, opposites, uh, that they are um, in uh, contradistinction to what we might think of as the overlooked and the uninteresting, right? And I think that particular category of uh, landscape is one that um, anyone interested in uh, a true sustainable practice needs to come to terms with. And then the last uh, was uh, over relying on uh, a lot of well-known examples, and I've kind of put things in the mix uh, over the last couple of years, but I do think it's useful to consider these uh, concepts in relationship to um, some places known and um, some uh, places uh, unknown. And I should, um, I should actually add one additional uh, uh, thought, and this comes from an experience I had a couple of years ago uh, working on an article for the Harvard Design Magazine on uh, pleasure and sustainability. Um, Kate Soper, uh, the uh, philosopher and art critic, uh, around that time um, published um, a piece uh, where she um, talked about um, uh, alternative hedonism and cultural re, uh, envisioning. And that uh, concept of cultural hed or alternative hedonism essentially gets to the heart of a way of thinking about sustainability that's not about hair, shirt, environmentalism, but realizing that there are already existing structures of feeling, already existing practices of everyday life um, that are um, being undertaken because they're pleasurable, 
sustainable practices that are pleasurable. So I've been seeing the proliferation of bicycles around here. I live in a very hilly part of the world where cycling requires um, a lot more exertion uh, than uh, in Toronto. And uh, when I look at all the cycling, uh, while um, many of you may do it because it's cheaper, uh, because you know it uses less um, petrochemicals, I suspect you also feel a lot better at the end of the week having exercised on your way to work, and that there's a pleasure that comes with that. It's not um, simply about sacrifice. So as I talk about uh, the manifesto, I'd like you to keep in mind this kind of stretching of categories, this um, sense that sustainability is not uh, simply uh, synonymous with green technologies, and that it um, intersects with um, ways of uh, living and working uh, that are um, pleasurable and that that might be an important um, tool for uh, landscape um, architects. Um, I want to start out by sharing with you um, uh, my standpoint uh, and a little bit about uh, the background uh, to the manifesto, which uh, I uh, initially wrote in 2007 um, to be delivered at an event in London and another um, in Beijing. Um, I, I think it's uh, understandable that a lot of uh, landscape architects, when they think about uh, sustainability, think primarily about the ecological aspects of sustainability. And it seems um, a matter of fact, given that our medium is biophysical and that we're um, constantly um, working uh, within a vocabulary that is constructed and um, found biophysical systems. It also seems imperative, given the global consensus about the impact of human uh, actions on the environment. But um, what frustrates me is the uh, lack of discussion about aesthetics within the larger context of sustainability, um, especially since even scientists, the scientists involved in the metrics and criteria for ecosystem services for the UN um, Millennium um, Ecosystem Service uh, Initiative, talk about cultural services as an important ecosystem service, and they include aesthetics in that particular service. So they're calling for more collaboration uh, and more, um, uh, not just uh, quantitative metrics, but qualitative metrics for why aesthetics matter in a sustainable practice. Um, I'm going to talk uh, especially about what I know um, in the uh, practice in the United States, and so I'll you know, qualify my comments in that regard. Um, but I want to um, situate uh, my own understanding of sustainability within a longer um, durée and um, thinking of the contributions of someone like Olmsted in the 19th century who was interested in parks for a couple of reasons. One, um, how they uh, performed environmentally, understanding them as these green lungs um, in the city, but um, also how they performed um, socially and emotionally. Um, he cared about how a landscape um, looked, whether uh, Central Park or here I'm um, showing a, a Klimt um, painting of a German park, the late um, uh, 19th century. He cared about how these parks looked because of um, how he thought they worked on the psyche. And he believed that the experience of this particular appearance, which we might now call a pastoral a form of beauty, uh, altered one's mental and psychological state. And so um, he understood that a certain kind of appearance performed. It wasn't just what it looked like, but how it operated on one's um, emotional and mental um, psyche. So for him, parks were experiences, and they were not simply environments. In fact, he wrote explicitly that a park is a work of art that, um, that produces certain effects upon the minds of men. So he didn't say a park is a place to recreate, uh, a park is an urban space. He believed it was a work of art and that it produced certain effects. And you knew it was a park if those effects were produced, right? So it was a performative space um, and that performance wasn't simply that it cleaned the air, provided sunlight uh, or um, a, a kind of green oasis. In fact, he believed that parks sustain civilization and culture as much as they sustain the biophysical um, environment. 
And here you can see uh, another painting of the period um, where you really get a sense of the sustaining aspect of these parks. This is a Prendergast uh, image of uh, Central Park. Um, and yet, I think when uh, contemporary designers often look back uh, to this period, they focus so much on uh, the environmental performance of these projects uh, and kind of shy away from the performance of um, a particular kind of appearance or beauty and the relationship between that particular appearance and at that time quite um, avant-garde uh, ideas about the impact of the environment on mental health. Um, that um, uh, what we glean from this work uh, is only one part of the tradition of um, urban parks. Uh, this uh, green uh, technology, um, uh, almost uh, reduction of sustainability away from its uh, economic uh, and its social and its aesthetic aspects and focusing almost exclusively on um, one uh, component, one leg, um, the ecological uh, or the environmental. So what I'm going to do is make the claim for re-inserting uh, uh, the aesthetic into the discussions of sustainability. And I want to try to make the case uh, by um, rescuing um, the visual, but a visual that is connected uh, to the body and to the mind. Uh, so not uh, assuming that what we see is somehow immediate and unfiltered, but realizing that aesthetic experiences are cognitively rich and they engage what we know uh, and where we've been and what we've experienced as well as um, what we're in in the moment. And I want to um, uh, engage these issues because it does seem to me that these immersive um, experiences can lead to curiosity and attentiveness, um, dare I even say empathy for the environment. And uh, here I want to say um, uh, a few uh, things about um, beauty uh, in general and also the stretching of um, beauty uh, in particular. I'm um, illustrating this point with some um, uh, uh, photographs, a photo montage taken by my colleague Julie Bargman uh, who uh, almost 15 years ago now started talking about the toxic beauty that she found in um, disturbed um, uh, post-industrial uh, sites. And the kind of um, beauty that she was talking about and others have been talking about is not synonymous with pretty or um, that which is pleasant. And it's definitely not exhausted by the visual. And uh, in this regard, uh, individuals like Bargman share sensibilities with um, uh, art uh, uh, critics and philosophers like Elaine Scarry and Arthur Danto, Dave Hickey and Alexander Nehemus who assume that the experience of beauty involves duration, it's multi-sensory, and that it's not contained in the visual alone. So when we're looking at um, something like this toxic soup uh, at an acid mine drainage site in Pennsylvania, it is simultaneously beautiful in terms of its color field um, uh, appearance and uh, ugly uh, relative to what one knows about the toxicity on this site. This uh, cognitive dissonance uh, is uh, one of the characteristics that the Surrealists talked about when they um, uh, spoke of beauty being um, convulsive, of um, including the kind of ex um, excitement and frisson that occurs with um, disturbing um, pleasure. I mean, other uh, less uh, perhaps intense but interesting examples might be uh, Kong Zhong Yu's uh, project uh, for the Tangi River Park, which you see on the right, uh, where he was um, aware of the need for um, an out-of-place element uh, in this wetland park in order to actually um, entice uh, uh, local residents to use a park of a totally different kind of a character uh, than uh, the uh, sanitized, dry, uh, irrigated, uh, artificial uh, parks uh, on the high ground. Or um, we can think about the Pump House Garden in Dallas, a private project residence that Julie Bargman worked on uh, on an old pump site adjacent uh, to a residence where uh, something as um, um, uh, junk-like and waste-like as construction rubble um, starts to take on um, uh, a different kind of quality, a kind of uh, quality that comes from uh, the recognition of um, reducing waste and um, repurposing materials uh, in new ways. Um, uh, here, um, 
I begin to uh, think about the possibility that um, designed landscapes might um, function in a way where the experience of these new forms of, of um, aesthetic um, uh, characteristics, whether we call them a new kind of beauty or a stretching of beauty, that uh, they may in fact have the ability to alter um, uh, both clients and the public's um, perception of a broader range of landscape types and um, perhaps have more to do with establishing um, a sustainable culture uh, from the change in sensibilities that might come about from this than they do from the actual transformation or metrics relative to uh, their hydrological systems or even um, the reduction um, of waste. Another way of saying this is that um, new forms of beauty, albeit strange forms of beauty, dissonant beauty or functional beauty, um, could be a necessary component of fostering a sustainable community. That beauty uh, uh, that is challenging, that is um, uh, reimagining, is a key component in developing an environmental ethic. And here I'm illustrating this with the Cranbourne Botanic Garden outside of Melbourne, Australia, um, a Taylor Cullody Lethlian project about five years old now, where um, your first view is a total dry garden. And then as you um, uh, move your head to the right uh, to sequence a series of demonstration gardens, this surreal juxtaposition of wet and dry, um, uh, a metaphor for the entire continent, but a visceral um, uh, juxtaposition of two radically different um, conceptions uh, of landscape. So this um, sensibility, this uh, thesis or hypothesis, you will, that beauty could be a tool within a sustainab um, sustainable ethic has evolved over the past couple of years, uh, partially in response to um, the limitations I've seen in mainstream sustainability discourse, partially through visiting sites um, and uh, landscapes uh, in an array of uh, climates and uh, microclimates. Uh, and here you can see the context uh, of this uh, unbelievable uh, botanic garden in the midst of a nature reserve uh, on the periphery of uh, Melbourne in the uh, southeastern uh, corner of uh, Australia. But it's also emerged uh, through um, the reading of authors, some of whom I've already uh, mentioned, um, who vary from f uh, philosophers and geographers, sociologists and eco-critics. And I want to just share with you a short passage from um, Larry Buell's chapter on toxic discourse in his book, Writing for an Endangered World, where he gets at this point uh, uh, from a, the perspective of literature. He says, what is missing from an American environmental policy today is a coherent vision that is sufficiently compelling to generate sustained public support. And this rings you know, so much truer today than it did 10 years ago even. Drawing on the writing of Ulrich Beck, he argues that what is needed are not simply more policies or technologies, but attitudes, feelings, images, and narratives. And so I think that works of landscape architecture, but also architecture, fall in that category of new attitudes, feelings, images, narratives, and spaces uh, that um, essentially um, build a role um, uh, for um, uh, sustaining uh, public support for the environment. And um, you can see uh, this, uh, hmm, something isn't coming down, so I'll just talk about this um, briefly. But you can see this in um, uh, Dennis Cosgrove's uh, writings about the relationship between designed landscapes uh, and what he calls uh, uh, the social formation, which we might call society or culture. <laughs> And he suggests that while it's uh, uh, obviously true that what happens within our culture affects the things we make, that there's also agency from the built um, work um, uh, uh, down to uh, and through uh, culture. And so understanding that um, uh, somewhere between an idealist and a materialist sense of the role of design, the agency that design can have in beginning to change uh, public um, opinion. And I'll just... Um, uh, suggest uh, how uh, uh, this uh, can, in fact, be played out uh, in uh, a couple of images. And let me just go ahead, because, huh, 
There we go. There's a couple things out of order there. So um, uh, there's that Cosgrove uh, uh, diagram. Uh, and I'll get back uh, to those um, uh, photos in a second. Um, I, I, so this uh, position uh, and uh, sensibility that I'm trying to pursue that uh, suggests that there is a role for um, aesthetics within uh, a larger um, desire to build a sustainable community it is grounded in literature, it's grounded in projects that I've visited, but I've got to also admit that it's um, grounded in my own um, experience of place. And uh, here, um, uh, just to um, make it clear where I'm coming from, I'm a military brat. My dad was a nuclear submariner. I spent most of my uh, life until I was 18 on beaches and coasts. And my understanding of the landscape has never been static. It's always been uh, dynamic. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, resilient or not relative to uh, human uh, actions and activities on the coast. Um, I uh, grew up in a controlled uh, landscape like this in Virginia Beach when I was in elementary school and a teenager. And uh, one of the first things, uh, first experiments I ever did in a biology class in high school was uh, measuring the changing uh, uh, dimensions of the beach uh, during the course of one semester when the Northeasters came in. And I have to admit, it was also a nice way to spend time with a guy in my class. A oh, mom, we're going, and, you know, measuring the beach. Uh, but um, but it was amazing to see the difference in what happened when you had a controlled boardwalk versus um, the parts of the beach um, further to the north and south uh, that were not, in fact, um, hunkered down uh, with this boardwalk. And it allowed me to understand that there was a difference between this kind of pretty. Uh, uh, condition and a different kind of beauty that came from the interaction between um, processes, uh, form, and the resilience uh, that certain um, forms uh, undertook. Um, last uh, and really important aspect of my own sensibility comes from incredible conversations I've had with my colleagues over the last uh, 17, 18 years at UVA, um, many of whom are similarly interested in uh, the um, uh, relationship between uh, aesthetics uh, and sustainability. Okay, um, second thing that um, I want to do, and you know, I'm not sure why these guys are out of order, but I got to go back to them just because uh, I think where they fell uh, had a lot to do with reminding um, me and perhaps you that um, aesthetic uh, uh, experiences. Um, are not just about being in the moment, but are actually so much about the relationship between what we see and what we know. So Emmett Gowan's photograph, uh, you can uh, evaluate in terms of its composition or its technical mastery, uh, the relationship between the um, uh, uh, tonal qualities that are in the uh, pond, but you react differently when you know that its title is Effluent Pond in the same way that you react differently to Bertinsky's um, photographs when you see them in a series uh, and compare the close-up view of the quarry with the actual uh, impact of that quarry uh, on the kind of larger landscape. So uh, keeping in mind that um, uh, unlike a lot of designers who um, think about aesthetics as synonymous, synonymous with what something looks like, uh, a number of um, art critics, philosophers, uh, and those interested in the relationship between aesthetics and environmental ethics um, talk about aesthetics in a, a way that's much richer, uh, complex, and uh, connected uh, to um, uh, uh, knowledge uh, and prior experiences. Then um, the Last bit of um, prologue uh, is just to um, set the stage for um, my sense of what was going on about five years ago in the United States relative to sustainability um, and the role that it played within professional practice. And I think uh, first and foremost, it's uh, really important to recognize that the word sustainability didn't even show up in the Oxford English Dictionary um, until 2001. Uh, and uh, it uh, enters into political discussions with Gro Brundtland's incredible work uh, with the um, UN World Commission on Environment and Development. 
Um, in the United States, the ASLA develops its own Declaration on the Environment and Development in the early 90s. And uh, I find it very interesting that when John Benton and Maggie Rowe, two uh, British authors, wrote their book, Landscape and Sustainability, in 2000, they said that while there have been you know, several articles um, uh, written uh, in the 10 years, really 15 years, between Brundtland's work and 2000, only two major books, um, uh, John Lyles and Rob uh, Thaler's books, um, dealt um, explicitly with um, uh, sustainability in landscape architecture. And um, Thayer's uh, speaks most directly to the connection between sustainability and the appearance of landscapes. And um, his text builds on um, important work done in the 1980s by people um, like um, Catherine Howitt uh, and Anne Spurn. Um, in addition, um, he and uh, his uh, contemporary John Lyle um, introduce the concepts of um, resilience into discussions of sustainability, and I'm going to return to this um, uh, uh, in a minute. Um, as um, uh, Roe and uh, Benton were uh, surprised at the lack of um, you know, long, uh, serious writing about sustainability in landscape architecture at a time when uh, United States um, architects were like all over it. Um, I uh, found it also very interesting that uh, there was an editorial in Landscape Architecture magazine in the summer of 2007 that said, is it time for a green issue of landscape architecture? just seemed crazy. What do you mean? Is it time for a green issue? So, you know, I just went online and Googled what happens if you put in sustainability and landscape architecture. There were about 700,000 hits. And it's interesting, four years later, 7 million hits. And so you can um, see that there's a disconnect between what was happening and the practice and the kind of bottom-up understanding of this as not a special issue with a bunch of like weird fringe people, um, but there was a big disconnect between that and the way that the profession in, in the United States and the professional organization was embracing sustainability. And I think part of it had to do with the anxiety about how that would come across with some um, clients. So um, I was categorizing uh, the kind of range of ways that landscape architects were dealing with sustainability. Um, some who said, well, what's the big deal, right? That's always been part of what landscape architects do. Um, some that were pretty narrow and thought about it solely as um, uh, eco-technologies or environmental sustainability. Um, some who said, I'm a you know, big designer and uh, sustainability is not something that designers with a capital D take on. And then an interesting group um, which essentially um, uh, adopted uh, many of the tenets of sustainability but talk about it in different ways um, uh, through uh, terms like operations and performativity but not sustainability. And you know, I'm um, totally um, uh, appreciative of the first group's position and that you can see an incredible array of precursors to sustainability in the history of our young uh, profession, whether it's the constructed urban stormwater management program in Boston from the 1880s, or the unbelievable work um, that people like Elsa Ryman and Jens Jensen were doing, uh, uh, understanding uh, native plant uh, ecologies and actually constructing those in um, radically uh, uh, new ways. Or more recently, uh, the writings of people like Halprin uh, and uh, especially the writings and uh, drawings uh, where um, uh, here he's asked if he's a, a, a landscape architect who tries to build everything architecturally like Noguchi or, uh, and artificially, or tries to make everything look natural. And then he goes on to talk about being interested in uh, the design um, between things, uh, events, uh, and you get a sense of a really different um, sensibility about uh, landscape. Uh, similarly, um, the work of people like McCarg and uh, his um, students, uh, Michael Huff and Anne 
um, Spurn in the 1980s. So there's an incredible uh, tradition in landscape architecture of dealing with um, the city through uh, what we might think of as an ecological or even before the term was coined a sustainable lens. And consequently, um, we can see why landscape architects in the United States were not picking up the sustainability mantle um, as quickly because they felt like it was, in fact, um, something that uh, had existed for a long time, was a marketing campaign on the part of other professionals who were kind of honing in on uh, their territory. And uh, yet, uh, finally, I think in the last year or two, uh, the American Society of Landscape Architects has actually changed their website and they now say the ASLA green since 1899. So they've kind of gotten over, uh, I think, uh, their ori original uh, apprehension. Now, you might say, well, you know, what's wrong with these uh, current categories? And I'll just say uh, a couple of things about some of the other camps. I think the work that's been done by groups like the Sustainable Sites Initiative, or more recently, the Landscape Architecture Foundation, attempting to um, develop metrics and uh, best management practices for sustainable landscapes is fantastic. Um, and yet, um, it seems to me that um, we need to uh, be clear about what we bring to a project that is not simply brought by a civil engineer, conservation biologist, or a restoration um, uh, uh, biologist. And uh, again, I um, situate this within recent literature in scientific journals that uh, is calling for planners and designers to help um, uh, with uh, uh, arguing for documenting and demonstrating qualitative metrics for aesthetics as an ecosystem services. So designers bring something particular to a sustainability initiative, and we should uh, claim it, celebrate it, and find ways um, to document it. Um, the uh, uh, other group um, uh, that often steps back from um, embracing sustainability in a really public way um, uh, are uh, many of the designers who were um, written in the incredible first uh, exhibition that occurred at MoMA uh, earlier in this um, uh, decade, uh, the first exhibition on uh, landscape architecture uh, since it um, opened in the 30s. There was a small one on um, Burley Marks, but this is the first really broad one. And it's fascinating that Peter Reed's introduction doesn't use uh, the term um, sustainability at all. And yet I think a lot of the work uh, that was in the exhibition in the catalog could be understood as an already existing um, sustainable practice um, where um, aesthetic experiences um, were part of the toolbox uh, for um, uh, sustainable design. And uh, while I don't want to um, ignore the importance of um, social sustainability, environmental, ecological sustainability, or economic sustainability. I simply want to talk about uh, this additional set of tactics uh, that um, we can imagine. Um, so the first um, um, tenant, and I'm going to go through the, f the first one in a little bit longer, and then the next uh, 10 uh, more briefly. Um, and there's 11, because sustainable has 11 uh, letters, and I couldn't get it down to 10, and anyways, like, random reason, but it's 11 uh, tenants. Um, so the first one is to think about landscapes as sustaining culture um, and going beyond ecological performance. And um, uh, for me, uh, first and foremost, design is a cultural act, and it, it does more than uh, employ principles of ecology. It translates cultural values into form and space, and it enables social routines and spatial practices, whether daily commutes to work, um, family play, um, recreational promenades. And so um, if we look at a couple of projects like Allegheny River Park in Pittsburgh or Park Trinitat in Barcelona, um, one, a narrow extended ramp that descends um, from the city to the river, and the other, a neighborhood recreation center that's woven into this uh, complex web of highways, subways, rail lines, and transmission lines. Both were built on disturbed sites, the intersection of co transportation and communication infrastructure, and both have become important social spaces in the city. Both of them have a memorable form. They reuse residual um, infrastructural spaces, uh, what Sola Morales called vague terrain, and they sustain social and cultural life. And I'm, I'm really interested in uh, Parque de Trinitat 
uh, in relationship to changing conceptions of beauty, Sola Morales, in his 1995 essay on um, Terrain Vague, uh, talks about Barbieri's photographs, which you're seeing on the left, um, altering um, his appreciation of these uh, interstitial, in-between spaces in the city that clearly didn't fit into the normative urban typologies that he and Manuel Sola Morales, his uh, brother and many Barcelona architects at the time were using to describe the city. And so I bring this up as an important example of a changing conception of uh, landscape aesthetics and even a changing conception of the kind of sites that are possible to operate within. And so um, uh, I um, uh, suggest that you know, whether it's literature or photographs, uh, uh, changing conceptions of beauty and landscape um, they, for some reason, seem a lot more uh, in, uh, incalcitrant than changing conceptions of beauty in women. And we know that um, uh, changing conceptions of body types have changed uh, over time. And uh, one of my students found this for me, beauty machine removes excess flesh without exercise. It sounds like everybody's uh, dream. But if you can read the small type, milady can smoke, read, and gossip, you know, while this machine basically rolls off her excess pounds. And so you're seeing in 1931, uh, clearly, I mean, she looks quite fine, uh, but she's clearly not up to whatever this new changing conception of beauty is. And I'd just like to you know, open up um, uh, the realization that we are quite um, aware of uh, these changing aesthetic conceptions in other fields and somehow don't see what happens when um, photographs like Barbieri's uh, um, alter a generation of both clients and um, designers. Um, the other uh, example of sustaining culture through landscape that I want to mention is a project like Chris Reed's um, uh, Silracium uh, chemical plant, uh, the framework plan that he did in uh, Lowell. And um, the reason I'm bringing this up is that uh, in this plan, he attended to the biophysical processes of ground, water, and soil and plant remediation that were to occur on the site, but he wanted them to be witnessed in the public realm and facilitated by the neighbors. And so um, a series of transitional landscapes afforded spaces for the routines of everyday life. Um, in the process of uh, the site transforming, it would have been sustaining culture as well as these local um, ecologies. This juxtaposition of everyday life and um, uh, this site on the edge of a neighborhood reminds us that um, beauty could unfold over time, that the neighbors, while um, uh, living through the slow process of remediation, the uncertain nature of remediation, uh, would uh, start to gain um, a different appreciation for um, this site uh, in their midst. Um, a project like this then could go beyond ecological performance and start to catalyze uh, new social processes um, and sustain um, a culture. Um, other examples, again, often described in terms of their uh, ecological sustainability would be projects like Mill Race Park in Columbus, Indiana by Michael Van Valkenburg Associates. And uh, the point I want to make about this is in addition to accommodating and celebrating, revealing um, seasonal floods, it, all, it does so within um, a set of spaces that um, also um, are important in terms of everyday life and seasonal life uh, in this small Midwestern um, uh, town. Uh, the place where one comes together for uh, uh, Little League baseball, uh, for uh, summer gatherings um, is the only thing that surfaces uh, literally uh, during uh, seasonal floods. And so we start to see the social routines of this place intersecting with the uh, biophysical um, uh, rhythms and routines of this uh, floodplain. Uh, uh, and the um, separation between uh, these two is called into question, and the um, uh, role uh, of uh, this um, flood uh, in the life, the everyday life of the city is uh, not ignored, uh, but actually um, uh, celebrated. These projects to me, and here's the, uh, for those of you who don't know, the parking seat in its dry state compared to its wet state, uh, and the mound is right here that you're seeing here. These projects to me uh, uh, are more complex and uh, actually more effective in terms of their um, um, ability to sustain 
culture, then um, big projects like the uh, Orange County Great Park um, uh, in uh, California, where uh, an extraordinary opportunity, an amazing um, uh, park, some I think 10,000 acres or so, but sustainability is um, always limited to um, uh, very uh, either environmental or uh, energy um, specific uh, uh, goals. And while they say it's woven into the fabric of the Great Park, it's not actually woven into uh, an understanding of cultural um, or social sustainability um, uh, in relationship um, to um, aesthetics. Um, alternatives, uh, which uh, again I find more complex, um, have um, a lot to do um, with uh, uh, bringing into relationship um, multiple activities on sites like the Zaragoza Water Park, uh, designed by Christine Del Noki and um, Alde Javert, uh, and here a water filtration system um, for this exhibition that later became a public park is intermingled with the public promenades and then eventually um, the swimming um, uh, pools and areas. Um, uh, Iñaki and um, uh, Margarita uh, describe uh, the beauty in this proposal in the following way. They say it resides in the suitability of the way in which activities are interlinked. So not uh, in a space uh, in and of itself, but in the interlinking of um, uh, the everyday uh, with the uh, infrastructural. And then at a, a very small scale, uh, trying to see how a project can in fact sustain culture uh, as well as um, uh, uh, be um, engaged in ecological performance. A very modest project uh, in Charlottesville where I live, um, a small playground uh, with a very small interactive um, uh, uh, pond or pool, uh, which uh, is uh, scaled uh, to um, uh, the children who play in this uh, small park. But it's also interesting in that um, the uh, water in this park uh, only, um, excuse me, only is on when um, somebody is standing where I am taking this photograph, uh, pushing down a lever. And so there's no water if children aren't playing, right? So there's a relationship between um, the scarcity of water uh, and uh, uh, when uh, folks are uh, literally uh, there uh, to play. There's not some a priori programming um, of the event. And so uh, these kind of small uh, gestures uh, as well as large gestures might be uh, understood as uh, starting to uh, sustain uh, culture. The second um, tenant that I um, want to um, allude to is one that um, designers are constantly involved in, and this has to do with the fact that um, we um, require new words as well as uh, new technologies uh, when uh, we're talking about uh, sustainability, and that uh, sustainable landscapes flourish when fixed categories are transgressed. And uh, I would argue that this is a, a pragmatic imperative in landscape architecture, and it's uh, actually disheartening for me to realize how limited uh, the field still is with um, uh, let the language of the formal and the informal or the man-made uh, and the natural. Um, there's uh, uh, often an assumption that nature is somehow pristine, uh, which again, uh, you can see in the case of, say, the acid mine drainage project in Vittendale that uh, Julie Bargman worked on with Stacy Levy, um, uh, that it is often not. I mean, how does language like formal and informal or cultural and natural man-made and natural uh, capture the strange beauty and horror of a forest that's polluted by acid mine drainage uh, that has been remediated and made into a public park. Um, is it natural? Um, is it man-made? It seems to me it's convulsive beauty or toxic beauty, as Julie would call it, is a hybrid. And so um, it seems to me that hybridization uh, and uh, stretching um, uh, terms beyond their pairing as binaries has the potential to open up new conceptual uh, design approaches uh, that restrict uh, our ways of thinking, um, where we begin to think about the relationship between um, the social and the ecological, uh, the urban and the wild. 
uh, where we start to think about the relationship between the marvelous and the disturbing, the beautiful and the pleasurable. And um, Hannah Hawke's collages have, um, for me, resonated with this sensibility where um, her glued drawing of water lilies uh, was actually made up of magazine images of um, urban oil spills. Uh, or her industrial landscape from 1967 uh, was um, assembled out of magazine images out of um, uh, both urban and ecological habitats, where um, one thing becomes another, where the relationship between um, these categories is stretched. Um, or we think about the enigmatic quality of um, this uh, initial scene at Cranbourne, right, which is on, on the one hand um, disturbing and the other hand a kind of marvelous, disturbingly um, inaccessible too, but a marvelous reminder of the vast um, dry uh, center uh, of the continent. The third tenant um, uh, is one that I think is increasingly um, more understood, uh, the importance of natural process over a natural form. Uh, and uh, this seems to be a, a kind of debate that's uh, slowly uh, but um, emphatically um, uh, kind of moving forward. Um, the, the main point that I want to make is that natural looking landscapes are not the only genre that performs ecologically. And I think it's especially true in projects like the Allegheny River Park, which had such a constricted site. It's only about 35 to 50 uh, feet wide. Uh, it was located uh, about um, 35 feet or you know 10 meters or so below the floor of the city and it's about a um, 2,000 feet or what about a, a half a kilometer in length um, so here um, uh, a really key thing about this design was the slipping of these long ramps between um, the um, upper and the uh, lower uh, terraces uh, and uh, the uh, importance of these um, constructed almost uh, armored uh, plates, the um, beams that you see here and the uh, benches uh, along the boardwalk that protected these pockets of plants from the incredible flooding of not only water and ice uh, that occurred here. Um, there wasn't enough um, a horizontal width to re uh, kind of recreate uh, an ecosystem. And so um, the structure was actually um, hardened and uh, a kind of protective armor uh, for this very um, small, densely planted uh, and resilient um, uh, group of um, riparian plants. Um, about 500 uh, trees were planted very close together, two to three feet, um, uh, two to three meters on center, uh, to create the spatial experience of a riparian clump, if, if not its form. And it seems to me that um, this particular project, um, we can understand through the lens of what um, Joan Nassauer uh, described as a kind of transitional aesthetic of framing what she called messy landscapes, of actually um, turning um, something that uh, might uh, be off-putting to a current generation used to static uh, uh, maintenance of um, public landscapes and putting it within a frame uh, that opens up um, their um, uh, appreciation of this. Now, I should say I was on the site when it opened, and Anne Hamilton, who worked with uh, Van Valkenburg's office, um, was there with her parents. And um, it was actually interesting being with her parents. Dear Anne, they said, can't you get the maintenance crew to come here and clean this place up? And Anne was like, oh, well, you know, she's one of the most interesting conceptual artists in the, in the world. And um, there were her parents who could deal with her artworks, but were not so um, wild initially about what they perceived to be the lack of maintenance in this park. Another, um, and again, I'm trying to show some modest examples as well as more um, kind of well-known examples. Another interesting project in this uh, natural process, um, or natural process over natural form, is um, a stormwater project not far from where I live, between actually where I live and the School of Architecture, designed by Nelson Bird Woltz and Biohabitats. And it's a stream valley between the university and a neighborhood. Most people would be walking through uh, this particular stream valley and not realize that um, the creek that you're seeing on the right has actually been um, uh, reconstructed. And it's not until they get to the joint between the stream and the pond, the um, retention pond, which is right here, um, where um, 
it is quite clear that it's a constructed landscape, and it's a landscape that, um, despite its appearances, is performing um, many um, ecological functions. The um, rill is uh, aerating the water. Uh, the forebay is uh, allowing the sediment to collect before it moves down into the second pond, uh, where it then moves into the uh, city stormwater system. And so um, here's a, um, an emphatic decision that the designers made, uh, having to argue um, uh, quite um, hard with the client uh, to um, allow this project uh, to not um, be a natural looking pond and stream, but to um, celebrate the fact that it performs better uh, because of the uh, clear uh, construction uh, that occurs here. It's interesting that the uh, Environmental Science Department has taken this project on as their um, uh, monitoring project for uh, their first uh, uh, year environmental um, science class. And so uh, in addition to it being right behind the freshman dormitories, it's a place where many of the early environmental scientists are understanding the value of design in um, the improved water quality uh, of uh, this uh, particular um, system. The um, projects that I uh, just showed you won't be confused for natural landscapes, and I'm just going to argue that that might actually contribute to their longevity. What do I mean by that? It's clear that this place needs to be maintained. It's on the list of the facilities management landscape crews maintenance regimes. They know that there's one maintenance regime on one side of the pond and another uh, on the other. And uh, this uh, is not an invisible landscape to them. Um, other uh, sites like this on grounds uh, that are natural looking often become neglected landscapes because they're assumed they can care for themselves. So there are some prompts here for care. Um, the fourth tenant um, has to do explicitly with this idea of recognizing art. And this is not a new concept. In the 19th century, there were a lot of debates about the recognition of um, art and whether uh, landscapes, designed landscapes, should be um, understood as works of art um, if they were pastoral or, or picturesque. Um, we can see it uh, in um, some projects that are almost um, uh, hyperboles of this uh, recognition of art the hypernature projects of Van Valkenburg Associates like Teardrop Park um, that are formful and palpable, um, that have a scale that essentially draws the attention of an urban audience that's distracted by the daily concerns of family and work or the overstimulation of the digital world. And these kind of sensibilities, this hypernature, requires a keen understanding of the landscape medium and frankly, a deployment of tactics like exaggeration, amplification, distillation, intensification, uh, transposition, and displacement. Um, this constructed wall uh, that's uh, about um, 10 meters uh, high weeps in the summer and um, freezes uh, in the winter. Um, it um, uh, evokes a kind of uh, extended uh, uh, placefulness, not only uh, the actual parcel or site, but the geology of um, uh, the peninsula of Manhattan and the larger uh, region. And uh, this kind of intensification of the aesthetic experience of nature renders it uh, present. And it um, resonates with a particular form of beauty that we might think about um, as the sublime, of uh, the unbounded awe that comes uh, with uh, these uh, large uh, landscapes. Um, Jonathan Haidt, the positive psychologist, talks about the role of um, awe when um, he's uh, talking about uh, changes in uh, human behavior. And he says that awe um, makes you stop. It opens you up. Uh, uh, it, 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 there's a moment of receptivity that creates an opening for change. So it's not a one-to-one, -one, design it like this, something will happen, but it's that um, possibility of uh, opening up, of um, providing uh, an opportunity, an opening uh, for change that I think um, this project um, uh, uh, illustrates. Um, the, the fifth tenant uh, has to do explicitly 
uh, with um, the performance of beauty. And thinking about um, aesthetics uh, as the perception uh, of uh, sensory uh, cognition, uh, as perception and sensory cognition, not as a particular um, way that something looks. Um, and the reason that uh, this um, uh, uh, tenant to me uh, uh, is so key is that um, a, a landscape experience um, works on our psyche. It affords us the chance to ponder a world outside ourselves. And through this experience, we uh, momentarily are decentered and potentially um, uh, renewed and reconnected uh, to the biophysical world. This is the left view when you come into Cranbourne, uh, the right view being that water body and the left being a cultivated uh, landscape. Um, I want to um, argue through this particular tenant that a, a somatic, moving, haptic experience of beauty has the potential um, to inculcate environmental values. And uh, Elaine Scarry writes about this in her book on beauty and being just, where she says that beauty replicates, it invites replication, it's life-saving, it quickens, it adrenalizes, it makes the heart beat faster, it makes life more vivid, um, uh, living worth living. And she goes on to suggest that when we experience beauty, it changes our relationship uh, to the object or the scene, the person, uh, or the painting. And I'll uh, uh, quote um, uh, from her text when she says that at the moment we see something beautiful, we undergo a radical decentering. We give up our imaginary position as the center. We find ourselves standing in a different relationship to the world than we were the moment before. It's not that we cease to stand at the center of the world, for we never stood there. It's that we cease to stand at the center of our own world. We willingly cede ground to the thing that stands before us. The sixth tenet um, has to do with uh, thinking about design, not as the construction of form, but the construction of experience. Uh, and to recognize the importance of um, designing experiences as much as designing ecosystems. Um, I've written about Rich Haig's um, Bloedel Garden in the past, and to me, the aggregation of experiences um, in this timbered forest is a great example of um, the power of a constructed landscape to, um, in a short period of time, in relationship to very different um, kinds of uh, gardens and spaces, uh, to um, uh, become essentially um, uh, tools or instruments for seeing uh, the found forest uh, anew, the found forest being there uh, on the left. Um, I show this particular um, uh, uh, project outside of Seattle because um, while many environmentalists speak of their early experiences in some overgrown woodlot or creek on the edge of a suburb as the place where they learn to revel in the exuberance of successional plant growth, the adaptive shelter of um, insects and birds and animals, these experiences being the reasons they became environmentalists, it does seem to me that designed landscapes, um, public gardens, um, in a site that's been disturbed by uh, lumbering and fire, can provide those experiences in well, as well. And in fact, they must, given um, how few um, small uh, remnant sites um, exist uh, near our suburbs uh, and our cities. The seventh tenant um, having to do with sustainable beauties being particular. And uh, here, again, to talk about the stretching of um, beauty as a category. Um, these uh, beauties will not uh, simply emulate their physical context, but act as magnifying uh, glasses, uh, increasing our ability to see um, what is found, whether uh, in an old and abandoned um, uh, steel uh, uh, factory like at Duisburg Nord, or in the dry um, environment of a place like uh, Mesa, Arizona, with a pulsating uh, and often dry arroyo um, uh, uh, fountain by Martha Schwartz, uh, or in uh, the array of places um, where uh, the particular 
may be productive as well as toxic, transposed as well as transgressive, um, found and made uh, regenerative and resilient. And uh, this array of um, particular beauties will challenge our sense of the landscape's aesthetic and require us to move back and forth between thought and sight, reason and senses, uh, mind and the body, uh, conditions that pragmatic um, uh, aestheticians like uh, Schusterman uh, and Nehemus attribute to not only aesthetic experience but artistic uh, evaluation. Um, um, one example um, uh, in this category uh, could be the Philadelphia Navy Yard where um, Dirt Studio has just completed the second phase of uh, Urban Outfitters um, uh, headquarters. And uh, the issue here was really um, allowing the um, owner to recognize uh, the potential building material uh, in um, all of the waste that was about to be hauled off site uh, and uh, to develop uh, a way of working uh, that kept uh, uh, so much of what would have been taken to landfills um, on the site. Um, so whether we're talking about a project that's immense uh, or intimate, uh, an abandoned brownfield site, an obsolete navy yard, or a lumbered forest, there's an array of uh, particular um, beauties uh, that uh, will be um, regionally specific. Um, the eighth tenant uh, is a new one um, where um, I talk about sustainable aesthetics challenging us through difference and dissonance. And um, uh, the point I want to make here is that um, one can um, uh, easily see in the context of other art forms um, moments where artists um, stretched our capacity uh, to um, uh, uh, appreciate uh, new uh, forms, whether in the work of Ernst or Frido Kahlo. And uh, to me, what Taylor Cullody and Lethlian has done in Australia um, operates in the same realm. And uh, one can't really um, appreciate that until you know what the rest of the um, Australian Royal Botanical Gardens look like in Melbourne. Uh, they took, uh, like a lot of um, British colonies, a pastoral and picturesque aesthetic and rendered it in their own plants. Uh, uh, and so um, what is appreciated um, at Cranbourne, their satellite botanic garden, is not only what is seen here, but what is known in relationship to um, the normative uh, botanic garden um, in the region. Um, similarly, Taylor Cullody and Lethlian, in their installation, uh, it's a permanent gallery at the Museum of Victoria, where they were asked to create a didactic uh, interior landscape celebrating um, the forests of Australia um, didn't stop with uh, education into ecosystems or um, uh, emulating uh, the um, spatiality of forests, not only through planting but um, uh, constructed canopy, but they um, included the products of that forest in a, a grove um, within that garden and uh, through uh, the dissonance of the constructed in relationship to this natural history exhibit um, um, underscored the thing that we know about forests, that they're both a source and a resource uh, for us. Um, the ninth tenant, um, an obvious one I think uh, uh, for many of us is that sustainable beauty will always be dynamic and not static. Um, our medium is um, not only material and tactic, but spatial and temporal. And uh, whether we're talking about places like uh, the Moss Garden where sublime beauty is um, ephemeral and created by the long processes of stump uh, and log decay, or places like Deweysburg Nord where successional uh, planting formerly called weeds and now spontaneous vegetation um, uh, uh, takes on a new character that's a value. Uh, or places like Candlestick Park, where um, the tidal um, um, detritus is not um, uh, uh, seen as garbage to be taken away, but in contrast to, in this case, the newly hydro-seeded lawn. Uh, or the explorations of um, ephemerality uh, that uh, Van Valkenburg's office has been um, exploring over the past couple of decades. I'm reminded here of a really um, uh, a favorite uh, quote that J.B. Jackson 
um, wrote in his essay on the word itself, where he says the act of designing landscape is the act of manipulating time, of slowing it down and speeding it up. So sustainable beauty will arrest time, delay it and intensify it, uh, and open up daily experience to the wonder of um, urban and social ecologies. The uh, tenth tenant uh, has to do with uh, the importance of um, resilience and um, regeneration uh, in enduring uh, beauty. And um, it seems to me that projects like um, Allegheny River Park uh, that were designed for disturbance and resilience um, allow us to appreciate uh, the dry condition in uh, relationship to its ability to withstand uh, the wet condition and the icy condition. That the um, uh, uh, clumps and the grove, uh, groves that were planted there uh, of species that would regenerate as multi-stem trees if uh, damaged through flooding and ice flows are valued because of that very um, resilience. Um, similarly, in a bit of an elegy, since um, Julie Bargman's moved her studio from Charlottesville to Manhattan, you're looking at the studio after the moving van uh, left. And um, the entry to Julie's studio in Charlottesville was a great example of uh, this concept. Um, it was the back door. The person who rented her the space had wanted her to come in on the other side. She, uh, after ripping out the, she, all the wallboard and the junk that was in this space uh, on the interior, transform this courtyard um, using, um, we'll call them harvested um, sumac and locusts from the adjacent uh, railroad right of way, um, experimenting with a lot of the techniques she used in public landscapes, um, uh, reveling in the damage done during hurricanes and microbursts uh, as uh, this uh, shaded north uh, facing uh, courtyard um, uh, regenerated and uh, uh, evolved um, over a couple of, um, well, uh, over a decade. Um, the power of it also, um, uh, uh, within a half a mile of this other landscape uh, near the architecture school, and a kind of interesting uh, side, you know, originally the lawn was to be planted with black locust, uh, which uh, are the larger plants on this upper terrace here. Uh, which are the first uh, pioneer plants in uh, really crummy uh, uh, over um, uh, farm soils in Virginia. The reason I bring up both uh, the uh, project in Pittsburgh and the one in Charlottesville is that um, since the publication of McCarg's Design with Nature in 1969, scientific theories about ecosystem dynamics have uh, changed considerably and resilience, adaptation, and disturbance have um, replaced equilibrium, stability, and balance as the operative word in ecosystem um, studies. And yet, despite the importance of these um, theories for landscape design and the decades uh, since they've been generally adopted in the science, um, many landscape architects in the United States, including our consulting engineers and architects, and our clients, operate um, in very romantic conceptions of nature as something that is stable or reaches a climax a community. And even um, recent ASLA conferences uh, are a case in point. At the 2006 conference, there wasn't one session on brownfield sites, only green uh, or blue uh, sites. In 2007, you're seeing the little brochures here. The theme was a Designing with Nature, the Art of Balance, which sounded like some retrospective um, view of landscape ecology and design from the 1950s through early 70s. And even last year's theme, Green Infrastructure, um, harkened back to the really innovative work of people like Ann Spurn, Michael Huff, Alyssa Rosenberg, Rob Thayer, and Bill Moorish. Um, I also um, uh, thought it was interesting that in 2009, after ignoring it, we were beyond it, uh, so beyond sustainability and into regeneration. So as a profession in the United States, we need to be a lot more cognizant of contemporary ecological theory. Um, uh, our adaptive uh, designs must be part of resilient and regenerative urban form. And here I want to talk about the um, analogy between uh, ecological and cultural resilience and regeneration and um, tie it into Randy Hester's book um, designed for ecological democracy that came out about five years ago. 
um, uh, Randy, who um, taught at Berkeley until he retired, um, talked about um, uh, sustainable landscapes as being enduring but not stable and that that enduring quality was an outgrowth of their resilience. And he described this characteristic as the characteristic that allows a landscape to maintain itself efficiently and compatibly through often dramatic changes in um, that threaten survival. That, um, this kind of design is the basis for resilient form that's fundamental to sustainable ur urban ecologies. He said that resilient urbanity versus sustainable urbanity can readily absorb change. Uh, in this way, resilient seems a, um, a better word than sustainability for the design goals of the city. Um, he says that a resilient city can uh, retain the essence of its form even after it's been deformed, uh, which is, um, for me, a great dis description of this locust tree in my backyard, which I couldn't bear to take out when it was um, hit by lightning. And, uh, the arborist took out half of it, and you know it's uh, essentially regenerated uh, twice the height ever since. So it doesn't look the same, but it's still functioning. It's um, resilient. Uh, it retained the essence of its form even after it had been deformed. Or similarly, at Cranbourne, right next to the dry and wet garden, the larger um, nature reserve is maintained through a periodic fire. Again, so um, a, a resilient landscape that um, uh, retains uh, a, a form uh, after um, uh, trauma. And then the last uh, tenant uh, has to do with the agency of landscape and what um, uh, I've come to understand is the pleasure of uh, sustainable praxis or critical practice. Um, here I'm drawing on uh, the work of people like Kate Soper, uh, who talk about the importance of um, pleasure and a sustainability uh, agenda. Uh, and so um, this allows us to um, begin to uh, think about a landscape that is uh, not simply uh, a place that is uh, deploying sustainable technologies, but that's initiating um, aesthetic experiences that open up uh, the public uh, uh, to um, seeing the landscape anew and uh, questioning uh, their own uh, environmental um, assumptions. And here, it seems to me that the um, perspective of the latter, how a landscape can open someone up uh, to new understandings of the broader um, uh, region or ecosystem, is the most important reason to care about sustainable landscape design. Um, beautiful, even new and disturbing experiences of beauty, they, uh, they decenter us. They can lead to the recognition of a place uh, as having uh, qualities. Uh, they can, in fact, um, uh, begin to engender uh, care and concern, and who knows, maybe even um, action um, about the environment. Uh, we might ask, why does this matter? Uh, because the mass media is replete with images and discussions of sustainability, uh, green politics, and global climate change. Um, and we can ask, are these forums the only effective means to change values and practices? And I think, like me, you'll realize they are not, because um, this kind of media saturation that seems to be cyclical, at least in the States, or revolving around um, Earth Day, every April issue of every magazine, um, can easily lead to cynicism as well as uh, environmentalism. It's especially true when it seems that every product and industry is now eco-friendly or environmental friendly uh, and that um, eco-bloggers uh, obsessively are recording, monitoring their daily impact on the globe, uh, or um, uh, eco-chic uh, cl clubs advertising that you can now um, party in a space made of totally recyclable, renewable, sustainable uh, materials. Or when the biophysical world seems to be represented as if it were a toy uh, to be befriended or hugged. Um, like others, I want to argue that there are multiple forums and forms for caring and learning about the impact of our actions on the planet, some visual, some textual, and some experiential. And like Larry Buell, I'd like to argue that we need more than reports and data. We also need products of culture, not just narratives and images, but places um, that move us to act. And so in this regard, it does seem to me that design matters and appearances matter. 
uh, that it's not enough to simply design landscapes that incorporate best management practices, um, that uh, design landscapes need to be constructed human experiences as much as ecosystem services and ecosystems. They need to move folks to action. It is true that the design landscape uh, takes up a very small amount of our globe's surface, yet they are visited and inhabited by people who have a great impact on the environment from um, everything that they do, from where they live and how they commute to what they consume. And if Arthur Danto is correct about our apprehension of beauty, that it's a polysensual activity that involves critical analysis between what we see and our past images and experience uh, to those in the moment, then um, clearly even new forms of landscape beauty are, pro are possible. They may in fact be um, even probable. And they'll be um, recognized not because they refer to past aesthetic, aesthetic forms and practices, but because they prompt the recognition of unrealized relationships between the human and non-human world. And here I'm sharing with you this strange little post out in Perth, um, Australia, uh, that was recording um, a comment uh, by John uh, O'Reilly in 1880. The surrounding sea and land were very strange and beautiful. Uh, from this perspective, we understand uh, the possibilities of new kinds of experiences and that these uh, experiences and their attached environmental ethics might in the end have a much larger influence than um, the small changes to a local ecosystem or watershed from um, responsible um, eco-technologies um, as worthwhile as a roof garden or a green roof or a vegetal wall uh, may be. I'm going to conclude by just saying that many professions and disciplines are going to contribute to our understanding of sustainability. I'm going to argue that landscape architects who are designers do so by making places that are constructed, performing ecosystems, and constructed aesthetic experiences. We are sustained by reducing and editing and doing less bad. But we're also sustained and regenerated by living in the world in its abundance, and its wonder, even its dissonant beauty. Uh, the appearance and the experience of new forms of beauty should have as much currency in debates about what a sustainable landscape might be and should be as the performance of its ecological um, systems. This might be one of the tools that jolts our clients and neighbors out of their complacency and inaction allowing them to recognize and acknowledge the world around them and maybe to transform them into a new generation of environmental, uh, environmentalist citizens. This possibility has been recognized by um, several scientists and scholars in the last couple of years who are involved in Millennium Ecosystem Services. They're calling for designers to step forward and contribute to the debates about cultural services and aesthetics as key ecosystem services. And I encourage those of you who are students and practitioners in the audience uh, to get involved in this uh, and uh, to um, reclaim, I think, an important role that designers can play uh, in what is increasingly uh, a global uh, imperative. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really happy to take comments and questions and um, challenges because it's like what's really been fun as I've uh, talked about this in uh, so many different contexts uh, uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, thank you. Uh, particularly for tenant number six, or maybe it's the fascination of the moss garden, and also for that um, interlude between tenants 10 and 11, mm -hmm. and for resilience. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, resilience as perhaps an alternative to sustainability. Yeah. And I think you've made a very, very strong uh, argument. There were a couple of other phrases uh, that I think uh, came up uh, 
throughout the presentation. One was the constructed landscape, a phrase which I'm very fond of. Uh, the other was the reference of the natural and the man-made, uh, which is hard, of course, to deal with without thinking of Scully's uh, mm -hmm. text. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure they got it right. And maybe just to, uh, and I, I hope it's something you're familiar with, and I, I'm sure I'm the classic scholar from Stanford, Robert Pogue Harrison. Harrison. Yeah. And because he writes two books, one, of course, The Force, mm -hmm. uh, which speak to the way as we as North Americans try and engage our landscape and mm -hmm. goes through uh, certainly a whole cultural history uh, of an, perhaps an imagined past and a mm -hmm. projective future. But then he writes a book on gardens, which starts out compositionally dealing with the garden, but then really speaks to the fact that it's the act of gardening mm -hmm. and something you raised of, you know, um, whether it was Anne Hamilton's parents objecting mm -hmm. to the lack of maintenance mm -hmm. or the necessity uh, of the water treatment um, just on the edge of the UVA campus mm -hmm. where it's necessity of engagement. Right. And again, maybe to me it came out best in um, the moss garden, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which which seems to have that extended sense of time. Um, that, and and yeah. it's not really a question, but I, I, in a way, uh, Harrison's read of it, to me, adds something that, whether it's McCarg or the whole list of you know, people in the last 50 years mm -hmm. is perhaps missing. Yeah. yeah, you're the second person in a week who uh, told me, because I know Harrison's work really well from Eccentric Spaces, his first text, and then, uh, or actually I'm confusing him with Harbison, no, so for Harbison the first, yeah, yeah, the first text for us, and I haven't read Gardens yet, so you're the second person in a week who said I need to I read that, so, others. yeah. There's one uh, on cemeteries and death, and there's mm -hmm. another one, in fact, on beauty and the interest, which is a Yeah, great, then I will definitely, yeah. thank you. Um, this issue of um, uh, maintenance uh, and uh, engagement to me is a really interesting one right now. Um, Julian Raxworthy, who I met in Australia when I was lecturing, uh, is an interesting landscape theorist. He is educated as a horticulturalist and now is one of the most engaging uh, theorists in Australia. And uh, he has been um, He's documented around uh, the world in a way that I think few uh, others have a range of projects that are kind of bottom up and dealing with the relationship between what is um, designed but also what is designed after the designer leaves through maintenance regimes. And uh, his, his case and argument is that um, architects and landscape architects need to be thinking about this extended range of um, practice and service. I mentioned it in the studio today of understanding that you don't just do construction supervision, but if you care about a landscape, you've got to actually think about its long-term um, uh, tending. Many of the examples are actually um, practitioners who also teach. Mm -hmm. So Julie, Michael Van Valkenburg. Uh, so can you maybe talk about the relationship between um, the academic milieu, mm -hmm. teaching, and then the ability to maybe um, think about practice in alternate ways? Yeah, because uh, Warren Bird and Thomas Waltz have um, uh, also taught on and off. And uh, the principles that Taylor Cullody, Lethlian, and I should uh, um, Kevin died this summer, uh, so uh, Kevin Taylor, so uh, the two partners who uh, remain, and uh, they have all had uh, part-time teaching uh, positions at RMIT, and in fact, uh, one of the interesting things about them as examples, and Australia as an example, is Australia is got a totally different idea about the PhD, and that a lot of practitioners get it, and uh, it's not just something for somebody who wants to teach full time in academia. And uh, Perry Lethlian is, you know, he, he doesn't need to be in school right now. He's a principal of the most prominent firm in Australia. But there is this culture of valuing practitioners being in an academic context for what they bring, and also uh, a valuing of the provocations that are uh, actually. 
uh, kind of delivered to them through the engagement with students and with um, um, faculty. So, I mean, I think there's a certain luxury that comes, I mean, I say that being tenured, uh, a luxury that comes from teaching that allows you to um, explore ideas. And it's also an incredible uh, collaboration because you can't appreciate Ben Valkenberg's work or Nelson Bird Woltz's work or Dirt Studio's work without acknowledging the students who passed through their studios and the collaboration that happened um, uh, over a period of uh, decades. So I, I think whatever we can do to try to build stronger bridges between practice and the academy is a really good thing. Uh, and I think uh, right now, at least my experience in Australia is that they were much better at getting practitioners back in and in a way that is, wasn't just in and out teaching, but actually, and they, you know, they also get a little bit better money to come back in, you know, in terms of um, grants and fellowships. But I think that rejuvenation is really uh, key and helpful. I don't know if it's still so good in Australia now with the recession, but it, w but it was five years ago. Yeah. yeah. I'm, interested in, uh, I'm interested in our perception of beauty not through physical uh, sensibilities, but more through the subconscious and primal mm -hmm. uh, understand or primal need for beauty mm -hmm. and I just wondered what your you sort of touched on it a little bit mm -hmm. in one of your tenants I can't remember which one but uh, do you have any ideas on that or any have you explored any areas in that way you know yeah you know um, I just wondered if you did well Dutton's book that came out a couple years ago talks about this and I mean I'll just you know confessional honesty here is that I'm just so anxious about universal anything that I know I should probably read that book, but um, it's a generational problem <laughs> that I admit to. So, um, you know, I hear archetypes and I run, and so it's just my, it's my own problem about absolutes and universals. But I, I need to read the book. It's on my shelf of things that I know uh, will probably uh, change my argument, but I have to get over um, you know, a, a bias right now that, that I've got. But, but yeah. you challenge beauty in your reference to, to the surrealist, yeah. uh, and, and uh, I mean, uh, in certain art practice, but it's Smith's who, in the end, maybe is more significant as mm. a philosopher and theorist in concept of beauty, and then do you extend it to a scale of certain art practitioners, whether uh, it's Heiser mm -hmm. or Terrell mm -hmm. or Richard Long, who in the end are very good landscape architects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Or, I mean, one of the tragedies to my mind is is the group uh, that is now trying to reconstruct Spiral Jetty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because Smithson is very upset, I guarantee. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, yeah. I mean, I, I think you were, maybe in response to Arna's question, that you are, in fact, uh, addressing uh, the validity of this constructed landscape, of landscape architectural practice is very much an art form, and an art form that has the ability to constantly change, which actually takes, in a strange way, back to Australia, mm -hmm. of the timeless dry landscape, mm -hmm. uh, that notion of Perth, where the sea coast is amongst the most extraordinary because the weirdest erosion anywhere mm -hmm. on the planet. Mm -hmm. And then in turn, back to the academy at Melbourne, where I've got a couple of colleagues who've been recording the sounds of Zen rock gardens mm -hmm. from RMIT. Mm -hmm. They go to Japan and then are, and they're sort of in the architecture faculty, but they're mm -hmm. really in the sound lab, but they're talking to the landscape architects. Mm -hmm. And that to me is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Thank you for raising all these wonderful issues. Thank you. Not one skeptic? I can't believe it. I want to be back there.
Anyway, I'm around for another day. I hope uh, I run into some of you. Uh, I'm in somebody's seminar tomorrow, I forget. Huh? And so anyway, I look forward to some uh, challenges. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>